Hello, my name is Bob Fitzgerald. I'll be your host today. Welcome to another segment of the Oral History Project of the Village History Advisory Board of Rouses Point. The goal of this program is to invite residents of Rouses Point to share with us their recollection and memories of our village many years ago. I am sure that in this segment we will hear many interesting things about Rouses Point. Today we are going to share some time with Mr. Lawrence Delano, and I'd like to say to Larry, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. First of all, we'll ask Larry Delano how long he's lived in Rouse's Point. Well, I've lived in Rouse's Point all of my life except for a period of about nine years between 1935 and 1944 when I was away, working away from the village. Well, that takes us back to uh, the uh, early part of this century, so to speak. You were born in Rouse's Point, Larry? That, that's right. And uh, is the uh, house where you were born uh, still in the village, and are you still living in it? Yeah, I'm still living in the same place, the house that I was born in, yes. Well, that, that's very interesting. That uh, is not uh, something that many people can say that they're still living in the house where they were born. W where is that house uh, located, Larry? It's at uh, 24 Church Street. It's probably known as Route 126. Or... On Church Street. Uh, now, that house, uh, is it... Uh, what, what is the history of the house, Larry? Uh, it was built by my wife's people uh, back in 18, the brick part in 1870. Your mother's family? My mother's family, yeah. They were the Weeks family. Yes. They came here in the early 1800s. From and uh, that's probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, house in the village, I would say. It's, or it's one in of the, the older permanent houses, yes. Yes, going back to the first decade or so uh, after the uh, year 1800. We're, re we're really going quite a ways back. Now, uh, that house was in, in your mother's family all that time. Now, how about your father's family, Larry, the, the uh, Delanos? Uh, when did they come to Rouse's Point? Well, Dad was born in Ticonderoga, New York, and he came to Plattsburgh in the Customs Service before it was located in Rouse's Point. And later on, the, the service was moved to Rouse's Point, and he came with the custom service. So the family, uh, the Delano family, goes back to uh, Ticonderoga. Yes. And uh, are they also uh, uh, an old family in the sense of uh, going back to uh, the early days of the country? Oh, oh, very old. The original Delano came in 1621. In 1621. Now, the, the name Delano, what is the uh, derivation of that name? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a really a French Huguenot family. Originally, it was Delanoi, and it was changed over the years. 1621. And, and uh, the Weeks family, do you have a history on them? How, how uh, long ago did they uh, arrive here? They came, they came in 1630 to Stamford, Connecticut from England. And they moved to Long Island, and then up to Rhinebeck, New York, and then up to Alberg, and then they came across the lake in the early 1800s and took up a, a lot from the Nova Scotia refugee tract. I think it was lot 90 or something. Yes. Well, if you don't mind my saying so, Larry. It's an 80-acre lot. Yes. Huh? If you don't mind my saying so, I'll, I'll say that you uh, are descended from two illustrious families. Well, I presume so. There's nothing I could do about it, one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> well, they certainly go way back, and, uh, and uh, the Weeks family particularly uh, go so far back in this area. And uh, the house you live in goes back to the uh, early days, so I think uh, we're talking to the right person here when we're uh, yeah. interested in the history of this area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, your father was a customs officer. Do you, do you uh, remember now, you may not remember right off the top of your head, but would you remember uh, the, the date or the year that he entered the customs service? 
No, I can't remember, but it must it must have been uh, my, it must have been early either early uh, 1900s or the late 1800s. Late 1800s or early 1900s, and he worked in Plattsburgh before uh, uh, that coming up to Ross's uh, point. Custom House was in Plattsburgh. This was a d desolate country up here then. And yes. People ran back and forth across the border with impunity. <laughs> <laughs> well. Uh, did you, when did your father retire? Uh, your father was Roy Delano. Uh, he, uh, well, I, I just I can't recall the date, but he lived to be 91, and he retired when he he, he was uh, he had uh, I think 50 years service. 50 years service. Well, I can't recall the date right now. Yes, and most most of that, or a good part of it, was certainly right here in, in oh, Ross's yes. point. Right here yes. in Ross's point. Yeah. Well, there is a picture here, Larry, that uh, I brought with me, and your father is in the picture, so mm -hmm. maybe we could try to hold this picture, if I can hold it steady enough, and get it on camera, and talk about maybe some of the people in the picture, mm -hmm. just briefly. Now, your father is in here. He's in yes. the center there. I, I believe it's in the third row. He's in the center, at the, towards the top. Yes. Yes, the third row, one, two, three, fourth, or fifth. I say he'd be fifth in the third row, right in the center. Yes, that's right. Well, that picture was taken uh, in uh, front of the Myers building, which was the custom house at that time. Yes. That, the custom house was upstairs there, and Myers brokerage office was downstairs, and later on the bank was in the right-hand side of that building. 1931. Did you yourself ever work in that uh, building, Larry? No, oh, not at all. No. no, no, not at all. No, your uh, your uh, career was with the uh, immigration. 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 Yes, that's right. Now, some of these pictures, or some of these people in this picture, I'm sure, are very familiar to you. Do you uh, offhand uh, want to just pick out a few and and uh, tell us maybe who they are? <laughs> well, uh, up at the top row, there's John R. Myers, who was the head of the uh, Myers Brokerage Company. And most of his staff are there, Fred Tinker and uh, Br George uh, Brothers is there, Gene Strong. Uh, now in the, row, in the row with your father. There's George Warner. George Warner is, uh, is standing uh, mm -hmm. to his left. And my sister is there, M Mrs. M uh, Ross. She was, uh, she was the secretary at that time. Mrs. Ross, the only lady in the picture. She's the only, only yes. girl there, yes. And there's Joe Fortier there, and uh, there's, there's so, so many that I, that I remember. And, uh, now, how about some of the uniformed people there? Can you uh, pick out some of those and maybe yes, recognize them? Yes, there's Charlie Bogardus, and uh, there's uh, Green, John Ross, very difficult to see. Uh, without my glasses. I think that, Maybe I should put my glasses on. I think that's Walter Connolly, next Walt, next to next Walter, to John Ross. Walter Connolly. Oh yes, and uh, yes. that's up under my glasses. I, I can't fool anybody much longer. Larry, this picture yeah. is uh, kind of small, so uh, oh, it's very small. We're having trouble picking them out. There's a uh, there's Lloyd Grace, and uh, there's uh, Ralph Chilton. Now Ralph Chilton was our was our athletic coach in high school, and we used to have pretty serious contests with the local schools around. And uh, Keysville, New York, was our was our worst competitor. Is that and right? Ralph Chilton was the athletic coach, and he did a very good job. When you were uh, in high school? Yes. Yeah. What what sports did you participate in yourself, Larry? Do you well, recall? Well, in high school, I was a high jumper, and I and I was a distance runner. I see. But I wasn't very good in the dashes. <laughs> <laughs> There was a little fellow named Kenny de Beaumont. He was about five feet tall and he had little short legs. And he'd go by me like I was standing still. And I never could understand how he could run so fast. Uh, he was very good. Well, the, uh, the short uh, guys usually run faster oh, he than was, the taller guys. He was a huh? demon. Nobody could beat Kenny de Beaumont. Yeah. Yeah. And Chilton was like a coach. No, he was a coach. Yeah. He, he was, was the coach. He was a coach. And I we were very strong on athletics at that time at Ralph's Point High School. Was this uh, during the uh, 30s, would you say? Uh, well, I, I was graduated in 1928. 
So it was in the, in the 20s. Oh, during the 20s. 20, between 24 and 28. I was in high, in high school from 24 to 28 in high school. Right, school. you graduated high school in 28. I was, I was a little, I, was, I weighed 90 pounds. I was in the 90 pound class. <laughs> uh, Larry, where was the uh, high school uh, located at that, well, that time, uh, when, you, when you graduated? That was the old, old building that, uh, that uh, Ayers took over when they came here. It was a three-story brick building. It was a big building. And uh, they had no auditorium there. Uh, we were the last class in 1928 to graduate from the old high school. And we had our exercises in the new building, which was just being built. Before that, the, the graduating classes were all held in Kutcher's Opera House because there was no auditorium in the old building. I see. So you yeah. missed out on uh, Kutcher's, but we, you... We, we closed the school. We, we you, closed uh, the school. You yeah. got in on the first graduating, uh, first, first graduation at the yeah, new school. It was just, just being built. The auditorium was just completed in 1928. That's right. Yes, now that old uh, high school was... Uh, at the same location where the main offices of the uh, right for the main office no, laboratories they, they, they worked they worked in that building for a number of years and then they finally tore it down and built a new building right in the same location and of course they extended it way back into the, the fields there yes yes well i think we've uh, we've looked at this picture uh, enough to see some of uh, the familiar faces larry and i guess we'll go on from here mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Larry, for uh, pointing out some of the people in that picture. I, I as you know, uh, retired from the Customs Service yes, myself. I know. I know. And you, were, I'm, you were a short timer. I was 40 years. <laughs> you had, you had uh, a little longer tenure than I did. But uh, I'm interested in uh, some of these uh, customs uh, officers and uh, the, yes. the history of it. Now, we'll get back to some uh, more uh, familiar yeah. items here. For instance, uh, the house that you were born in and, and that you still live in, it must be an interesting house. And, and I, I think how the home was heated in the early days that oh, would be interesting it's to people. A, it's, it's a 13-room house, and uh, in the olden days we had a kitchen range in the kitchen and uh, a stove in the living room, and there were no heat upstairs. And there were seven of us kids. I was in the middle. There were, I had three older sisters and two younger sisters and a younger brother. And we'd wait to hear Dad shake the stove in the morning. And, and we'd all go down and dress around the stove in the morning to keep warm. The, the bedrooms were comfortable because we had plenty of blankets, but they weren't too comfortable running around in their skivvies. Yeah. So we, we didn't have any... Uh, <coughs> Central heating in those days? Oh, no central heating, no. no. We heated we uh, heat with, with, with stoves. With stoves. And we, we bought coal from the Strong and Casey Coal Company, and they came and delivered coal and put it down cellar. Uh, I forget how much. It was very, and it wasn't very expensive, but it was we, we got several tons of coal. And we kept coal fire going night and day, of course, in the kitchen stove and in the, and in the front stove, yeah. Yes, now did the... Uh, yeah. Did the children help out with the uh, carrying of the coal or the tending of the furnace or anything? Very, very little. I, no. I got very little respect for my older sisters, and I, I had to carry most of the burden. <laughs> <laughs> you, you did a lot of that, huh? Yeah, yeah I, I did. I, uh, I remember myself the, uh, the days of the coal stoves and uh, the uh, bringing in of the coal and uh, oh, yeah. carrying out of the ashes and what have you. Oh yeah, that was my job. But we, we, were, we were a very congenial family. We got along very well. We, that was the days before, before television and, and uh, we enjoyed ourselves among ourselves. My mother was an excellent piano player and we would stand around the piano and sing it all together and we uh, created our own enjoyment. Yes, well, those, those days in many ways were uh, they were happy days. Happy me. days and maybe simpler than uh, the complicated uh, I, I think so, yes. society we live in today. Uh, it sounds very uh, pleasant, uh, the, the, the memories you have of the, uh, yes, we're always, the were, family when you were young. I hung up my stock until I was in my teenagers, and uh, there was always a baby in the house, it seemed like, and we hung up our stockings, and they lined up on the stairway in the morning to go down for Santa Claus every morning. And they, they'd rouse us out of bed, the little ones, and uh, we'd have to go along and open our presents in the morning. 
poor old dad, he filled all the stock in the forest there. But uh, we managed to fool the kids for a long time. Yes, well, I guess it was that way in many families back at that period of time. Yeah, there were, happy, there were happy days. Yes, I, I think, uh, I think uh, you probably have a lot of happy memories of that period. Yeah, I remember hanging on my stock until I was in my middle, middle teens. Yep. Yes, well, uh, what about uh, uh, recreation or entertainment or uh, sports or other things to, to uh, enjoy during that time? Were, well, were there sleigh rides or hay rides or anything of that oh, nature? Oh, yes, there was some of that. My, 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 I played tennis mostly. I enjoyed playing tennis. And we had tennis courts here. Then there was a tennis court behind the Episcopal Church. That's torn down now. And I played with tennis with Earl Christie. And he was a demon on the tennis court. He's still around town. <laughs> hey, uh, we uh, we'd each win in our turn, I guess. And uh, and then there was Goodrow. He was a tennis player. He went and jo joined the FBI. And the last I knew, he was down in Connecticut somewhere. And there was a tennis court over in Lacole, and I joined over there, and we played tennis against St. John's, and, and uh, I, I played a lot of tennis. When I was in Messina, I, I joined the tennis club there, and we played against Cornwall and Potsdam and Canton. And I was, uh, I was, I think I ranked number three in the Messina at that time. Very good. You, you, you may have started uh, <coughs> a, a tradition here in, in this area because we still have some it's, it's, yes, good tennis players. Uh, yes, uh, I, I, uh, it's too bad that there's not, not more, t more tennis played because I think it's a very, a very helpful game. How about your, uh, did, uh, how many uh, brothers and sisters did you have? You had uh, seven in the family, huh? there, there were seven. I had uh, five sisters and a, and a baby brother. Five sisters I, and a brother. He's retired now from, the, he was a, he was a, a um, flight engineer and flew all over the world. He lives on Long Island. They're all, all the family is living, They're all the kids, all seven of us are living, and all well, thank the Lord. Yes. Well, I was going to ask you maybe about some of the uh, activities that your sisters might have got involved in, but maybe you wouldn't know too much about that in the way of... No, no, I, was, I didn't pay much attention yes. to that. <laughs> what, they, what they did for fun or entertainment. No, no, I didn't pay much attention to that. Uh, you, uh, of course, went into the immigration service. It might be interesting to uh, tell us uh, how you uh, came to sign up with the immigration service. Well, that, that's a pretty long story. When I graduated in 28 and I first went to work in the storage department of the D&H, and the D&H was a busy, this was a real, all of the real town. And uh, the storage department was up there on Chapman Street next to the roundhouse. And uh, we handed out all the necessary equipment to maintain the engines and the uh, and the cripple track, and there was a blacksmith shop there, and and uh, there was uh, four of us in there. So I was the youngest man there, so I worked the midnight shift, of course. And uh, then uh, summer the next year, in 29, I took a civil service exam, and Plattsburgh was posted there. And uh, I didn't hear anything from them until that December of that year. And I was uh, appointed assistant postmaster at Rouse's Point. Rouse's Point was a, a civil service job then. It was a, we sold enough stamps to make it a, a, a civil service a job, employment. And Leslie Ryan was the postmaster. Leslie and Ernest Ryan, they, uh, they established the North Countryman here and uh, a printing office in the old Kenyon building, which is across from the, from the drugstore now. And that, w that was originally a, a, a movie house. And when I was a little boy, we used to go to movies there for 15 and 20 cents. And of course, there was silent movies. And Marguerite Bertrand played the piano there uh, for, for the movies, and she'd play soft music during the love scenes and wild music during when the cowboys were chasing the Indians. And, my, and uh, we thought that was fascinating. But, but that was long before the Lyric Theater was built on Pratt Street. That was a Kenyan building is still there. And Dr. Uh, oh, let's see. There was a doctor's office upstairs. Dr. Uh, 
Oh. Maybe you'll recall no, it later. I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd forget it. You'll Dr. Allen. Allen. Dr. Allen had an office upstairs. Yeah. Now, uh, you were working for the post office department at that time. Now, how did yep. you get from the post office department into immigration? Well, uh, we, we, were, we were started into a serious depression, and the stamp sales went down, and the office was relegated to third class, and my position was abolished. So I no longer had any civil service protection. And uh, the postmasters changed, and we went into another administration and so they let me go and put, on, put another man in my place. And I had no recourse at all uh, because I had no more protection for civil service. So I went to work then for, uh, at Ayrst. And I was the seventh employee at Ayrst at that time. They were just starting up. Richard McKenna was in charge. He was a nephew of this founder. And uh, they had a man named Rothmer who came down from Montreal. He was a chemist. And Luella Papin was, uh, and uh, Connie Brown, they were in the finishing department. They, they put the, the, the uh, packages together. And I was in the shipping end of it. I, I uh, managed the shipping. And I worked upstairs in the laboratory too. I made gallons of distilled water and, uh, I, and I worked the, uh, the laboratory equipment. And I was pretty busy. But in the meantime, I'd put in applications everywhere for reinstatement in the Federal Civil Service, and I heard nothing at all. But all, when I was working, I worked uh, there for about six months, and finally I got a letter from H.R. Landis, the District Director of Immigration in St. Albans, Vermont. And he said there was an opening uh, as a Board Patrol Inspector at Messina, New York. And I remember very distinctly that the salary was $1,765 a year. <laughs> so I went into the letter to, to uh, Dick McKenna, and I showed him. I'd just been, recently been married. I was married in 34. And uh, he said, to you, if you stay with us, I guarantee you, you will, you will do well here in this plant. It's going to grow. And he was prophetic, too. They really did grow, didn't well, they? They certainly have more and, than seven employees uh, now. I guess so. <coughs> but he said, we'll have to wait because I can't afford to meet that salary right now. And he said, you'll have to wait. And uh, So I went home, talked over with my family, and I decided to go to work for the immigration. So I went, I, uh, went to Messina, and uh, I met uh, Dave Benjamin, was the Chief Patrol Inspector. I'd known him here in Rouse's Point. He was an immigration officer here. And he put me right to work. He gave me a pistol and a Ford car and a flashlight, and he said, don't get hurt, and two boxes of shells. So I went out on the patrol, and, and uh, so that was my training. And I stopped in the grapple pits and practiced with a pistol. I got to be efficient with it. Made the pistol team in six months. And those were, those were stirring times. Yeah, well, uh, you, you then went on to spend uh, how many years in the Immigration Service? I was six years in the, patrol, in the Border Patrol, and then uh, I took the in-service exam for Immigrant Inspector in 1941, and I was appointed Immigrant Inspector at Roosevelt Town, New York, in 41, and I worked there until 1944 and I was transferred to Rouse's Point in 1944, and I worked in Rouse's Point uh, since not, from 1944 until I retired in June of 1972. And you had a total of 40 years in, in at that time? I had 41 years and 11 months, and that was the maximum, and I couldn't, yes. I couldn't get any more retirement, so I retired at 80% of my base pay, and the governor treated me very well. I have no complaint. Uh, before we close, and I think we are running out of time, uh, I want to jump back to Erst because I know yes. there's a story about your father having something to do with Erst coming to Rouse's Point. Yes, quite that, that's an interesting story because Dad was a custom inspector on D&H 34. You know, we had, we had uh, 12 passenger trains a day through here then, one way north and south and east and west. And he was on 34 and McKenna was going to Plattsburgh to look for a factory site. And Dad had been on the Board of Education. He said, Mr. McKenna, why don't you jump off here and look at, we have a building here I think you'd be interested in. 
And uh, he looked over and he was interested and uh, I talked over the board and I, I guess they, they knocked that building down to him for a pretty reasonable price. So that's how Ayers got located in Rouse's Point and has brought fortune to this village in, in, in salaries. Yes, it certainly has. Well, uh, I don't know how much time we have left, uh, Larry, but we'll uh, see if we can perhaps wind this up maybe by asking you if you can remember some of these places and uh, briefly maybe what you might have to say about them. We have uh, St. Patrick's Church here now, which was originally located on Church Street. That's yes, the street your home is on. That's uh, where our street got its name. The church was up at the end of up the end of State Street, just across the road. It was a brick church, and the foundation is still there. Yes. And uh, now St. Patrick's School, are we, are we uh, talking about the school that's there now, no, or was there one before no, there that? Was, there was a, a three-story uh, white clapboard building there, and I remember one Fourth of July, they had a cannon down on the lake shore between Slingsby's and Marnes' dock, and used to shoot that off on the Fourth of July, and one day they made a mistake, maybe the iron was tired or something, but the thing exploded, and it's a very fortunate the one that was hurt, because a chunk of the cannon went right through the convent wall in the second story there, and that was where the that was where the sisters lived upstairs. That's on Maple Street. Street. No, it was on Maple Street, just up at the end of Liberty Avenue. On yes. the end of Liberty, yes. Just across, right where the old, where the new school is there, yes. Right. And uh, part of this uh, exploded cannon went no, through the wall. Right through the wall. Yeah. You're yeah. going to certify that that's a true story, right, that's Larry? A fact. It's a factual <laughs> yes. I think okay. we're here with Larry Delano. We're conducting an interview here uh, for the oral history project of the Village History Advisory Board. And we've been reminiscing with Larry about the early days in Rouse's Point. And we're talking about Larry's memories of certain buildings and institutions in the village, like St. Patrick's Church and St. Patrick's School and how about Rouse's Point High School? Uh, we've already talked a little bit about that while you were uh, attending Rouse's Point High School, but uh, do you have any other uh, memories of Rouse's Point High School you could share with us? Only that I, I managed to get to school every day. I ran every step of the way there in the morning and home at noon and back and uh, back at night, and I, I always ran all the way to school and back. That was quite a, quite a distance in a, in a, in a way. It made me a good pair of legs. It lasted me for a long time. Yeah, which is why you... Uh, now, now they ride to school in the school bus and, and have to jog in, in afternoons in order to get exercise. Yes. Yeah, that's a lot of difference, isn't it? Well, it is, it is. And I, I guess a lot of the uh, people your age or my age or uh, people uh, that went to high school in those days, uh, they did walk or run. That's right to school and back, and uh, it was a healthy thing. Now, how about the old post office? Uh, what do you know about that? Well, do you remember, other yeah. than the fact that you may have worked for the postal department briefly? When I worked in the post office, it was on the corner of Chapman and Lake Street. It was a big three-story brick building, and uh, we, uh, we handled a lot of customs mail then. Ralph Chilton did most of the inspection. They came on, the customs mail would come in from Canada, and, 15 to 20 bags of parcel post every day. And uh, it'd be examined by the customs officer there and then we'd, we'd uh, dispatch it. And that was my job to dispatch. I was, my job was to dispatch the mail mostly. And upstairs over the, uh, up over the post office, that, that, the KSC had their rooms up there. And the Catholic daughters used to put on card parties and we used to go up there and play cards. Milo Marnes and I, we used to have a ball. We'd, we, had, we would double and redouble. We made some terrible scores. And we kept them in the laughter most of the time. We dropped cards on the floor and things like that. But, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Were you sorry we to see prize. that building go? We won some prizes. <laughs> <laughs> Doilies and things. We'd win prizes once in a while. Yes, I was, it, it was sad to see that building go. It was a, it was a landmark. Yep. Uh, now, how about the... Uh, the Customs House, I guess we're talking about the Myers Building when we're talking uh, about Customs House. Yeah, and, and, yeah, the Customs House was in the Myers Building and the Immigration Office was up on Pratt Street 
across the, uh, right across the yard from the station. And they, they'd come down from Montreal. The main road was, the, that was the King Edward Highway. That's the one that came down by our house and down through the village around this point. They'd stop at immigration and stop at customs. And there was uh, no buildings on the border at all in those days. The Canadian office was in La Cole. And uh, it was only after that that they put the buildings on the border where they belonged. Yes. Did you work in the uh, building, you say, on Pratt Street? Uh, no. That was, no. That was before no. you? No, that was, I was, I was before I went into the service. Into the service. I, was, I was in the post office when, when that building was op occupied. I see. So uh, the uh, custom house at the Myers building was there for quite a long time. Very, uh, a long time. I guess you were you were pretty familiar with that building uh, oh, yeah. and the people in it. Oh yes, I remember. Uh, I remember during Prohibition, uh, on the way to school, sometimes you'd swing around that way, and uh, in front of the building would be an old Buick car there, uh, or a Hudson touring car loaded with beer, and the back end would be shot full of holes and the gasoline, and then the beer would be running out on the ground. Those are those are stirring times, and really they were. Uh, they uh, a lot of bootlegging going on and. And up beyond our place, up at the corner, that was Fairbanks's corner, and that that is, uh, and uh, the other corner up where the customs was, that was, uh, oh, I can't think of his name now. But uh, th those, uh, that was called the Broken Knuckle up there at Fairbanks's corner. That's where the Lafays live up there now, because the Canadians would come down with tubs of ice and and uh, beer, and the locals would go up there and buy their beer and, and get pretty well saturated. And there was a lot of fights there, so they, they called it the Broken Knuckle. That was a, quite a spot in those days. Well, that was that was uh, at the time you were uh, in... I was uh, a young kid. I was and a, you're a young kid at the time, right? Yeah. That prohibition was in 1919. I was 10 years old. Well, well that's smart enough to know what was going on. It's before, a little before my time, uh, most of that history, uh, but I'll tell you one thing, I can sympathize with the beer drinkers in those days because I was a beer drinker myself, yes. and I, uh, <laughs> I never pass up a glass of beer. Uh, well, that Canadian beer was good beer, and they came from miles around to get it. Yeah. Yes, so uh, I, I guess they knew a good thing. Uh, we're going to... Uh, Talk about the ferries now. Uh, I know you know something about the ferries. Uh, you were, uh, again, a, a youngster maybe at that period. Yeah, Goodsell operated the ferry, uh, 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 what do you call it, the Marnes Dock. That was before they built the bridge. And they operated the ferry there for a number of years. And then he, he started a, a, a cable ferry down where Barcombe's Marina is there now. Uh, that wasn't very successful, I don't believe. But he started a cable ferry there. Uh, ice cutting does does that ring any bells? Oh you? yes, we, uh, we we before prohibition uh, before uh, refrigeration, we had uh, ice house on the farm and uh, Bill Mumley used to cut ice, and uh, he'd bring up uh, with a team of horses he'd bring up thirty or forty cakes of ice and we'd put it in our ice house and cover it with sawdust, and we kept our, uh, things refrigerated all summer with that, and then the milk station was up there on alongside the Rutland track. And uh, they filled that ice house full of ice uh, in the winter, and uh, they uh, they refrigerated the cars there, the milk cars and butter cars. And you know, they uh, they tell me that the refrigerated cars were were originated on the Lake Champlain and Augsburg Railroad. Yeah, and they call them briefers. Yes. They uh, they were insulated the walls of the car, and they put a crib of. Uh, in each end, and loaded from the top with ice, and uh, that way they could ship milk and butter from into all down to New England, all the way into Boston, and it would arrive there fresh. And uh, that was uh, the Rutland Railroad. Then was a busy place. It was originally the Lake Champlain and Algonquin Railroad. And my uncle Hiram was an engineer on that railroad, and uh, he he uh, he drove the engine from from here to Malone and back, I believe. And they were a proud outfit, the engineers. And the, the, they were the cream of the crop in Ralph's Point, the railroad engineers. And the black smoke would roll away from that roundhouse so you could hardly see. 
<laughs> and the local housewives, they, they, they could never do their washing when the west wind was blowing <laughs> because the place was, the whole town was saturated with coal, with coal, coal, coal dust and soft coal smoke. And when they repair an engine in the roundhouse, they'd have to build a new fire in it and they'd put it out on the cripple track there. And uh, they stoke it up with soft coal and green wood and then they put a blower on it and the black smoke would roll over the village so that you could see in front of your face. You couldn't walk through the fields anywhere, but you'd be black to your knees with, with coal soot. And they, they, were, they were busy, they were busy days. I remember the, uh, there was always four or five engines in the roundhouse. Tommy Shinbear was the hostler. He ran the he ran the uh, the turntable, and an engine in and out. You could turn an engine right around there and bring it in backwards or frontwards. And, and uh, Albert Barcombe was the foreman, night foreman of the roundhouse. And then they had the uh, they had the uh, the repair crew that uh, they took care of the of the wrecks. They had a, they had a wrecking crew. And Tom Weatherwax, he ran the crane. And, uh, oh, there was a lot of people. It's hard to remember them all. But it was a busy, busy place. Uh, now, this would be back in the 20s, they would imagine. In, in, the, in the 20s, yes. Back in the 20s. It, yeah. the, the railroad made this town. There was only, there was no other income here. The, the Sheridan Iron Works was in Champlain. That was the only income they had over there. And the only income in Rouse's Point was the railroad and the government salaries. Yes, all well, government I guess Rouse's Point was known far and wide as a uh, Rouse, railroad railroad uh, Rouse's Point was center. known far and wide as a railroad yes. center. Yes. Yes. And as I said before, there were there were twelve passenger trains a day. We have t we have two net trains a day now. In those days, there were twelve passenger trains a day. Now, Rouse. when you were an immigration officer, you'd uh, work those trains. Now, would you oh, yes. would we, you go to Montreal and pick yeah. the train up in we, Montreal? We'd go into Montreal at six o'clock on on thirty five. And we'd come back on, on number 10 at night. And there'd be always one customs and one immigration officer uh, on, the, on the regular trains. And uh, the passenger agent in Montreal would call up when he anticipated a larger crowd. He'd call the custom house at, uh, at uh, or the immigration office at Ross's Point, and he'd, uh, he'd ask for extra help. And uh, we furnished uh, the railroad that service weekdays for nothing. But extra help they had to pay for, and Sunday work they had to pay for. They, they worked Sundays at double time, and uh, and when they called for extra help, they'd assign a, ma a man to go in there on an overtime basis. If you were working up at Overton's Corners eight to four, you might get a call in the middle of the afternoon. You want to work ten tonight, you know, so you'd have to make a decision right there if you wanted to work <laughs> a sixteen-hour day or an eight-hour day. Yes. Uh, and you say, yep, so you'd go home quick and t take a bath and shave and shower and change your clothes and jump on number, you get to at four and you jump on number 35 at six and go to Montreal and you get home at midnight. Yep. Well, it so was, it was, well, we, uh, we made, it was a... Uh, we made a lot, a, a lot of money in overtime and it was, it was a good income, it was very good income. It was a, uh, a job that... Uh, where you were serving uh, the public, and oh, oh, yes. uh, you you were uh, it was, it was a, forced to make some sacrifices. Oh yes, and on excursion trains, there'd be uh, there'd be uh, fifteen and twenty cars, you know, those, and they'd be standing in there, uh, and sitting in the vestibules on suitcases, and uh, it was a madhouse. I can imagine. It was yeah, a madhouse. Yep. Yeah, yeah. When you got through one of those trains, you were soaking wet, and the air conditioning was rather new. <clears throat> And one car would be 70, and the next car would be 40, and uh, you, you'd come off of there with, uh, with, your, with your shirt sticking right to your back. It was, it was t the air conditioning was not uniform in all the cars, and if you had 10 cars to work, it was, it was, a, it was terrible for your health. Terrible. Now, by the time you were retired from the job, I guess the, the uh, heavy traffic had slackened oh, yes. somewhat. Uh, yes. Very much so. Very much so. Very, very much so. It, it, it yes. was, so it, you were able to it, see it, the change over the years. Yeah. We, we, had the, we had the best part of the travel in, in, those, in those years, the best part of the travel. Now they don't go to Montreal at all. They examine the train right here. Yes. But we, we ordinarily, we'd have the train done from Montreal to Ross's Point. It had about an hour and 10 minutes running time. And ordinarily, we had it done. But if we didn't have it done, it sat right there in the station until we finished it. 
because the train couldn't leave until it was cleared both custom and inauguration. You'd have to wait. Sometimes uh, they made a mistake in Montreal and didn't order enough help. Sometimes they sat there an hour. Oh, I can imagine things yeah. must have been oh, hectic. <laughs> and the same thing applied at, at, the, at the customs at Champlain. We, sh we shared the primary inspection with the customs and, uh, and uh, they tried to assign enough men to cover the job, but you never knew what the traffic was going to be. And sometimes we were overstaffed, and most of the time we were understaffed. And then the traffic get back up halfway to Montreal. Well, not that, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> this not seemed that. Like, it seemed like that, but, but it, it was backed up quite often. Very well, the stresses and strains of the job... Uh, well, when you came off of that job at Champlain at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you, you know you've done a day's work. I'll bet. You, you were really dragging. That's right. Yes. Uh, before we go on, I'd like to uh, mention again that we are talking to Mr. Lawrence Delano of Rosses Point, who is a retired immigration officer and who was born in Rosses Point and still lives in the home on Church Street where he was born. And we're getting uh, some reminiscences from Larry about different places and uh, things here in the village. Uh, something occurred to me when we were talking about the ice cutting that Yes. You had an ice house up at your farm oh, there. Yeah, it's still no. there. It's you, still there. You, that was actually a working farm then. Uh, oh, yes. I, 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 was, I uh, was a farm boy, and uh, I took care of the cows. We had horses, chickens, pigs, and I milked cows in the morning before I went to school, and uh, home at night, and the same. And, and uh, I took care of the pigs and took care of the chickens, and, and uh, did the farm work, whatever there was to be done. We didn't, uh, we didn't mo do much planting, but we had a dairy farm. My mother churned the butter, and we made up butter, uh, salt-free butter for the local people. We sold milk to the neighbors at five cents a quart. And uh, you made cottage cheese, and I delivered it down to the A&P store and the Grand Union in little tubs. And uh, we were self-supporting. We did our butchering in the fall and put down, uh, put down. Uh, uh, eggs in in uh, in brine for the winter, and uh, it was a it was a really working farm. And uh, Dad was of course working in the customs, and I took care of most of the farm work. Well, uh, I'm sure you have uh, great memories of that period uh, and and uh, being on the farm and working on the farm and uh, well, I think it's 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 a, it's a, it's a great it's a great life. I I'm happy to have been born in the country and and had the experience of taking care of stock and seeing animals born and taking care of them and realizing that you know that uh, that they were tied in the barn by the neck all winter and dependent on you for their food and their water and it gave you a, grew, grew up with a sense of responsibility. You know, and I, I think it's a, it's a great thing for a young man. Well, we still have some farms in Rouse's Point in this area, oh, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. that's one thing that hasn't completely disappeared. Oh, no, uh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm great. I, I'm for the farming community. I, uh, yes. I, I, yeah. I think it's great that we, we uh, still have farms in, in the area and farmers, and there's so many of these other things that we're talking about that are gone forever, maybe, but uh, that, yeah. that farm life is at least... Uh, oh, lots of things are gone forever. I remember <laughs> that the, the Canadians used to bring in uh, milk in sleighs to the milk station. We, they put up a lot of milk that went all down through New England, and uh, they'd come by the house with the sleighs, and we'd run out behind and hook our sleds on the back, and they'd give us a ride out to the milk station. They were a congenial bunch, and they, they'd have three or four cans of milk on the double horse team. The roads were not too good in those days and they had to plow in the door to get down here, but they brought their milk to the milk station and uh, shipped it out. And uh, the milk station did a big business here. It's all gone now. It's all gone. Uh, well, we, we were talking about uh, amusement uh, earlier and uh, I did mention ice skating, and you said that oh, yeah, you were pretty much of a tennis player well, we skated in the early days. But we used the lake a lot more then. You did, you did some ice skating. Everybody was out skating, and we'd go out there with our cars, and they'd hook on the back with a rope. And we, I've had, uh, 
a dozen people on the back, including the parish priest and everybody else there. And we'd run them down the lake and, and swing them around and bring them back. And we had, we had a ball, uh, especially in, in open winters when the, when the ice was clear, you know. And, and we skate sailed a lot. You don't we, see too much of that anymore. No, we, we, we made skate sails on the old gunny sacks and we skated yes. up and down the lake. I, I've, I've had as many as 20 people on the back of that car up and down the lake. Yeah. We'd, uh, I had an open car and I put the top down in case you went through the ice. And, and uh, it was, uh, we enjoyed the lake. We really enjoyed the lake. Well, I don't know exactly what the reason is why there isn't as well, much people, fun out on the lake as there used to be. I don't know. I people, people are living on wheels today. I mean, they, they, yes, we're too yeah. mobile today. Right. We, uh, we have That's lots of places to go and things to do. We have to make do with what we had in those days. Yes, well, uh, it's just, it sounds like uh, a lot of fun just listening to you talking about it. Well, we, we, we enjoyed it. We really enjoyed it. We enjoyed the village. It was, a, it was a comfortable place to live. It always was a comfortable place to live, I find. Yes, well, I think Rouse's Point is still a nice place to live. I'm I sure do. you agree. And, I uh, do, too. We, the old days had its uh, fun, and uh, today we've, we've got uh, things to do also. And in those days, there was a lot. There was a lot more local stores. Uh, people didn't depend on Plattsburgh as much then. There were there were a yes. lot more stores, and, and the, the village streets were were busy with stores. There were a lot of uh, trade went on in the village in those days. Not more than than today. Yes. Well, that's a big difference right there. Yes. Yeah. People are too busy going into Plattsburgh that's right. and uh, that's right. everywhere else that's these right. days. It's to pretty hard, pretty hard for to business. stay around Rouse's Point and do much ice skating or what have that's you. That's right. It's pretty hard for business to, to compete you know, with, the, with those big stores yes. in Plattsburgh. That's right. Right. We uh, we see the the change very much in that area. Yep. Not too many stores here in uh, on uh, yeah. Lake Street. Uh, Larry, I'm going to get into uh, another subject here that might be uh, of interest to people. Uh, watching this, mm -hmm. uh, getting, getting some of your uh, philosophy on things maybe. Now, you've lived uh, through a lot of uh, different uh, presidents of the United States. You've so seen how the change of administration can affect, uh, or used to, affect the uh, government service and uh, how the, the change in administration sometimes resulted in a change in the local authorities. But uh, all during that time, uh, who do you think was your favorite president? Well, you know, you, 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 may, you may not believe it, but I, I think uh, my favorite president was, uh, was uh, Harry Truman. And you know, it's a funny thing about it, he was a product of the Pendergast machine, one of the most corrupt machines in the Midwest. But I think he did a very good job. He was a down-to-earth president, and I, I admire a lot of things that he did. Well, he was in for uh, <coughs> part of a term and then uh, one full time on his own. Yeah. And I guess he had enough time in, uh, in the White House there to make his mark if he was going to make it. And I, I often hear people say that they, they liked Harry Truman. He was a man of the people. Yes. We've had presidents in there who, who, did, who never knew anybody that made less than $50,000 a year. And I think that's a sad thing. But Harry Truman was a, he was a captain, an uh, infantry captain in the war. And uh, yes. he saw a lot of hard life. And uh, I think he was a man of the people. Well, I won't ask you whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, but I, I appreciate your answering that question. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going to agree with you that uh, Harry Truman is their favorite president as well. That's strange. I didn't think that many that. Because I'm a Republican, really. I, I never thought that many people appreciated Truman, but... Uh, I, well, I think as time goes on, he's beginning to uh, be known think, better as, so. uh, as a I, good I, president. I, I think so. It takes time sometimes to appreciate anybody. But uh, I think uh, after listening to you, tell us about your, uh, your life and uh, experiences. I think we, we'll put a little uh, value on your opinion here. and. Uh, Maybe we'll go along with you that day. Uh... There's been a lot of changes. When I, when I went into the Border Patrol, we were in the Department of Labor, and, and uh, we, we were uh, kind of an orphan organization. Ma Perkins was Secretary of Labor, and we didn't have that much authority. And uh, we, our uniforms were forest green, and we wore breeches and puttees. But then we transferred into the Justice Department, and uh, things picked up quite a bit. Uh, we, we got better cars. 
We used to go to Detroit and pick up our own cars, bring them home in the convoy. And they were specially uh, d designed. They had uh, high torque motors and, and uh, extra heavy generators and batteries. And we'd bring them home in the convoy, eight, ten at a time. And uh, we got better equipment, we got better sidearms, we got night glasses, we were radio equipped. And uh, we, uh, we were more efficient. We had a backup unit in Chestertown. And uh, we, we, were, we were a better efficient organization. But you know, even though we worked night and day, 24 hours around the clock, winter and summer, we estimate that we only got 20% of the illegal aliens. Yes. 20% was the maximum. And that's a, that's a, sad, that's a sad thing to, to contemplate. I don't believe they're doing any better today, even though no, they're working guess. out there night and day, and we don't appreciate them. Right, right. The problems are still there, and the immigration service is still on the job, but... Uh, we, we don't appreciate them. They're, prob appreciate they're probably uh, having the same uh, problems that, uh, that you face. Yes, worse. As, far, as worse. far as the percentage worse. of uh, worse. people, we uh, we illegals, the, that they can interdict. We didn't have the drug problem then. We had the liquor problem, but we didn't have the drug problem. And, you know, uh, shortly after I went in, they abandoned the custom patrol for a number of years. And they reinstated them after a while, but we had the whole burden of it for, for a long time. Well, again, we have uh, not too much time left, but we can get yeah. into a few other subjects, perhaps, uh, Larry. Seems like a long time to me. Yes, well, <laughs> we, we've been on, uh, on this uh, memory kick here for quite a yeah. while, but it's, yeah. it's, it's very interesting. And uh, once again, I want to mention, before we go off here, that uh, we are talking to Larry Delano. And uh, as the program nears an end here, perhaps we can jog Larry's memory a little more on uh, some subjects. What are you most proud of doing? What are you most proud of being? How about those two questions? Those are rough questions. Uh, yeah. What are you most proud of doing? Well, I, I think putting the best face I could on the, on the work that I did. I, uh, one thing I, that, that I, I noticed about law enforcement is that you, that you, should, you should try to understand people and, uh, and give them the courtesy of, of uh, of the of their uh, life, because one thing I never I never did I never ignored a child. When I was on primary inspection in the car coming from Canada, I'd be talking to the people in the front seat. There'd be a little kid in the back seat with big eyes. And I'd reach in and I'd grab him by the arm, and I would never look at him because you, you know you you your, your personality is too strong for a child, and you you fight them. But I'd grab him by the arm like that and. Uh, and pay no attention to them at all. But then when the car pulled off down the road, we could be waving out the back window at me. Yeah. And things like that. Uh, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, Larry, and I, and I think that's something to be proud of, uh, that you were able to... Uh, and leave, trying to try to leave them laughing. I remember one yes. time we were busy at Champlain. It was primary work. Primary work is probably the most important work, because if the primary officer doesn't send them in for secondary, they're down the road and you never see them. Yes. And uh, this car came in from Ontario, a nice car. And uh, two well-dressed men in the front and two well-dressed women in the back, middle-aged. They were waiting for the stupid question. You know, the cars were lined up half a mile back and they had four lanes and it was hot. And they sat there waiting for me and I, they pulled up and I, I stuck my head in the door and I, in the stage whisper I said, where are you fellas taking these two girls? And the guy looked at me and he said, I think we'll take them down to the hotel. Well, you know, I said, come on, you hold up, hold up traffic. And off they went on. Now, that was the inspection, you see. And, uh, but those things, they never, I don't believe most people ever forgot that inspection. You know? Yes. And uh, it, it, it left a better opinion <laughs> well, you, <laughs> of, the, of our work in, in their minds. At you, least were, to, you were representing Uncle Sam. Absolutely, and I think 100, you did a, 100%. That was the best inspection I ever made. I think you were doing a good job based yeah. on that uh, yeah. account of things, Larry. And as a, as a retired uh, customs officer myself, I, I like to hear somebody talk about the job in those terms. 
we, we depended on the customs and they depended on us. And uh, like I say before, on primary inspection, you were out there on the line and you had to make up your decision like that because they were stacked up there waiting to go and they were impatient and they were upset. And you had to make up your mind whether the car was going to go in for, for secondary customs or secondary immigration or whether the car should be put over there and torn apart for inspection. Yes. And you had to make that decision and make it like that. Right. And uh, I, I do believe they're still doing the same thing. And that's the most important phase of our work. The secondary men had their job too. Because you sat at the counter and they came in and you had to make the decision then. Why was this person sent in here, you know? And you had to make a decision. So yes, Larry, the, the, <laughs> there were judgments uh, made. Uh, and, Second, uh, in seconds. And uh, there was a lot of experience and training and... Uh, you didn't realize, but you listened with the inner ear. Not, not everybody was capable of doing that job, I'll no, tell you, you that. You had to listen with the inner ear and, yes. and your conscience and, and decide whether the people were lying or telling the truth. I think that's uh, a pretty good wrap-up, Larry, and I'm, I'm glad that we had you today with us. And uh, it was good talking about... Uh, it was nice talking to you. It was, thank you. It was good talking about uh, the history of Rouse's Point and uh, the history of, of uh, your government service, and I enjoyed it very much. And I'll close by saying that we have been talking today with Larry Delano from Rouse's Point. My name is Bob Fitzgerald. This is the Oral History Project of the Village History Advisory Board of Rouse's Point, and we'll see you next time.